My grandfather's great-grandfather, uh, Panayoti, was from Arcudorima. When the uh, Orloff Rebellion broke out, uh, Panayoti uh, and others uh, in the family uh, fled towards the Taietos. Uh, some members of the family uh, fled towards uh, Trifilia, and it's still Katsei uh, in uh, the Trifilia area. But uh, our uh, particular wing uh, of the family, not the cousins, uh, came into uh, the Taietos, established, uh, formed the village of, uh, of Nihori uh, near Dirachi. And Panayoti's three sons make up uh, uh, the three major wings, basically, of, uh, of our family. Uh, there was Athanasios, Ioannis, and uh, Elias. I'm from the Elias wing, which was my, uh, Elias was my um, uh, grandfather's grandfather. As I started to research the family, initially, uh, when I would ask the question, uh, they would tell me that, that uh, he was a monk uh, somewhere in the mountains living as an aesthetic. Uh, and they said he was falsely accused of murder. So it became a very interesting story to me when I was young, and then when I was older I did more research and, and found out a little bit more facts. Anyway, uh, he, he was married before he became a monk, and he, uh, before he became the monk Ioannas, apparently very well known in the area. And uh, some of his children stayed in Erhori, but my wing of the family basically went to uh, w uh, went to the Laconian uh, uh, part, which was opposite, opposite where uh, Nihori is right now. Uh, they basically uh, uh, were in the village of uh, Alevru, which is in the uh, Epanuriza villages. Uh, the, the main village of, of the area was Yorizzi, as I indicated before, where I was born. And basically, uh, my, gr my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, uh, were all born in Alevru. I was, I was uh, born in Yorizzi because my mother's, my mother's family uh, was from Yorizzi. Yorizzi is not that far from Alevru, it's the next town over basically. My grandfather came to the United States in uh, 1897 with his brother, uh, the Mostenis. Uh, he had a third brother called Andonis, and uh, he also, they also had a sister, uh, Panayota. My grandfather uh, was the only one out of the siblings who, who basically went back, went back to Greece uh, because he came in 1897 with his brother. Uh, his other brother came uh, a little bit uh, after that in the early 1900s. I'm not sure if my grandfather uh, ever became an American citizen, uh, but his brother, Demostenius, who came at the same point in time, wa uh, became an American citizen in 1907. So it may be that, in fact, uh, my grandfather um, was a citizen or maybe had applied for citizenship. Uh, so he went back to Greece. Uh, uh, when he was going back and forth, uh, he was obviously uh, saving money and then ended up buying uh, property uh, in Alevru. And eventually, over time, he bought uh, you know, 40, 60 stremata uh, in the area. And when the war broke out uh, and uh, the aftermath, he stayed. He decided to stay in, uh, in Greece at the time period. So uh, most of the family, my direct family, was in the United States. There were various uh, family members uh, from, let's say, uh, the brothers that I indicated earlier, from the Athanasius line, and from the and from the Yanakis line, and uh, and many of them uh, went into the uh, Massachusetts area. So this is going back now uh, over a hundred some odd years uh, that they also came. And then when I say uh, they came, uh, they, they probably were about. Uh, uh, 12 to maybe 15 members of the family that came into the United States uh, very early in the, uh, in, the 20th, in the 20th century. My grandfather and his brother were the first of the family who came to the United States. But in saying that, uh, it's important to understand that not only did they come over, but also other families that uh, were related to us uh, were also in the United States. So um, the village of Alevru, for example, where my, where my, uh, my father was from and my, where my grandfather was from, 
uh, just about everyone had a family member in, in the United States. So when they came over to the United States, there were actually people from their villages here uh, in the United States. And uh, many of them also came when they went into Massachusetts. They also came with other family members. It's important to understand that when, when you're uh, uh, from a particular region of Greece and your family is there over a, a very prolonged period of time, in our case, uh, 200 years or so, uh, through marriages, uh, through um, uh, uh, being at weddings, uh, baptizing children, blood relationships, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you have a situation where, where just about everyone knows each other. Uh, and in many cases, uh, they're related to each other. And, and they continue to spread out because what happens is uh, in our particular faith, you can't, you can't marry anyone uh, who, for example, is your cousin or your second cousin. So the, the families just spread out marrying other families. So our family, both on my, my father's side, the, the Katsai, and on my mother's side, which is the, the Vorilei of, uh, of Yoritsi, uh, these are very large families that uh, basically are linked are linked to, I'm not going to say hundreds of people, but maybe thousands of people over time. And uh, to the extent that people from Alevru, people from Yoritsi, people from uh, Castagna or Castori as it's known right now, actually leaving. Uh, and uh, when they came into the United States, they were ba basically grouped together. When you look at the, at the ship records, as a matter of fact, and you look at er any one of those family members that came over and you do an analysis, and you look at the ship records of who was on the boat, you'll find, I find, at least five to ten names that I know off the bat, uh, family names, because we're still linked with these families, uh, even, even after a, a long period of time. Um, and, it's, and it's really, uh, uh, quite frankly, interesting when you look at the, also the records of where they were going, what their addresses were. So when I look at my grandfather who went to Washington Street, I see other people from, uh, from the village, let's say the Varnavellas family, which we happen to be related to also, were uh, a few doors away, for example. Uh, and it was very exciting, for example, to have these addresses that you can look up uh, in uh, the various records. And in my case, which is a future story, but as I went into construction, and I'm uh, demolishing buildings and building new buildings. I'm discovering that I'm building buildings right where my relatives uh, used to live a hundred some odd years ago, which is which is kind of exciting, uh, you know, in, in a different degree. So, but getting back to to our, our family history. So, um, my grandfather uh, uh, went back to Greece. Uh, he was uh, by by temperament. Uh, he was a Laconian, but uh, even within the Laconian uh, milieu, if you will, or genre, he was regarded as being uh, extremely, uh, extremely, I'm not going to say rough, but let's say the Spartan Spartan, if you will. Uh, he was a, a personality that basically didn't like people to, um, uh, to ask him about what he was doing in business. And as a matter of fact, when I was a little kid, uh, they would tell various stories about some of the things that he would say. For example, if people were asking him, uh, uh, where, uh, where are you going, Lya uh, or Ilya? He said, Piano Nagamiso Timiterasu. In other words, he would say, I'm going to screw your mother. So he was that type of personality that uh, was regarded as being uh, a little bit uh, interesting, uh, let's say, a, a pretty rough guy. He was so rough, in fact, that, uh, and he had uh, eight children, my father was one of them, that when the children got old, old enough, the boys, they basically ran away to, uh, they ran away to Athens uh, in the middle of the night because they couldn't address him to, you know, to leave, uh, uh, to leave the, uh, uh, the village. But since he had, in fact, uh, he was an agrarian, a farmer, he, like many other people in the family, had very large families. So in our case, uh, my uh, father's family had uh, eight siblings, uh, most of them boys, uh, one girl, and, uh, and this represents also a, an educational aspect because uh, the children were basically the workers on the farm. 
And in uh, our particular areas, uh, you know, people went to school uh, because of the legality of a certain age. But uh, they basically were taking, taken out of school at an early age so they can, they can work the farm. So that's, that's how it, it basically started. Uh, my, my father, uh, during World War II, he was, he was, uh, he was a little young, uh, but his brothers had fought in, uh, uh, in the invasion, uh, Mussolini's invasion, uh, through Albania. They were in the Albanian mountains. Uh, and uh, actually, when you go back into the history of my family, it's something I didn't talk about. But there was basically no war that was fought <clears throat> from the time of the revolution uh, that members of my family did not fight in. Uh, in many cases, uh, many lost their lives in, in different battles, including, um, including in Mikrasia when they, in the, in the 20s, uh, where various Katsos members uh, fought. So they fought in the different wars. His brothers were in, uh, in, um, in Albania, my father, when the, um, when the Civil War broke out, uh, he went uh, into the north. Uh, he was one of uh, two or three people that survived particular battles in the mountains in the north against the uh, communists. But my people were basically, uh, in general, because this is important to note, they were basically not political types. Uh, where we come from, uh, uh, it's more, the blood is more important than what uh, uh, party you're from or what coma you're from. There was no way that any of our relatives were going to kill a relative because if they were in a different party. That, that, would never, that would never happen. I don't want to go into that history because that's a long history, but there were obviously members of the family who were on, on the communist side and the, and the non-communist side uh, uh, during the um, post-Second uh, uh, World War uh, scenario. My, my grandfather actually had an opportunity to bring his whole family back to the, uh, the, the United States because of the fact that he was in the U.S. Uh, from a very early period. But at the time he was older and uh, his uh, children were getting married, other people were fighting in the mountains, etc. Uh, that uh, he just didn't want to come to the United States. Uh, so how did we come into the United States? We came to the United States basically through my, my aunt my aunt Christina, who was, um, uh, because my, my grandfather was not going to come to the U.S., the only one who could bring the children, and the children right now were much older. Uh, my aunt Christina uh, uh, basically got the prosclusy, if you will, uh, or the, uh, uh, the ability to come over through my, my uh, grandfather's younger brother, Andonis, uh, who was in the United States. And uh, as I indicated before, Andonis, Lemostenis, and Panayota, uh, his siblings were in the U.S., as were distant cousins, many of them, who are still here, and their grandchildren are here right now in Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, all the way up into the, into the, into the main area. Maybe 1,500 in all the year, uh, uh, people came from the Hellenic Republic. There weren't that many Greeks who were coming in uh, uh, that early. In the beginning, uh, they, they lived uh, in, uh, in, basically, in basically apartments where maybe 10 men would, would live together. Uh, they would basically sleep on the floor. There would be one person that would, uh, for example, have the duty of cooking for any particular night. It was a time period that um, that they were also being chased. In other words, uh, I didn't go into the story earlier, but uh, for example, there were many people from Alevru and, uh, and uh, the other villages nearby. They all knew each other, obviously. They, they did work the streets. They worked as peddlers. Uh, you weren't allowed uh, then uh, as, a, as a foreign, as an alien, to get a, a license or a permit uh, to sell in the street. So basically, they were, they were working I illegally or sometimes they were working under the permit of someone else. And they were constantly uh, being chased uh, by the police. Okay? And uh, what, is evident, what is evident in some of the histories, some of the oral histories of what took place, is that they also uh, uh, were chased. Uh, people would kick them. Uh, there would be uh, sometimes uh, gangs in the street of different uh, ruffians uh, in New York at that particular time, because New York was a, a pretty rough, a rough place. But 
but they also had established, um, and not a lot is written about this, but they had established their own, for example, protection scenario. And in many cases, uh, they had whistles and basically clubs. And if somebody was in danger, they would send a whistle. Uh, people would come together, basically, and uh, you know, take care of the situation. But also because it was illegal, they would uh, they would have to pay off uh, uh, basically people to in the unit to, to keep uh, away from them, in particular the police. So a lot of the police were basically paid off by them. One of the most um, one of the most interesting uh, uh, stories, actually, not story, but a, a real thing in terms of uh, Hellenic American history took place in, uh, in February uh, of 1890, uh, 1898. And uh, when you go into the history and you can look at it, I, I first came across it in reading, uh, in reading uh, Contopoulos' work on the, uh, the history of, uh, of the um, uh, Hellenes in, uh, in New York City up to 1910. As I was reading this story about the immigration officials, how they raided a particular um, a place where there were push carts and things of that nature in lower, in lower Manhattan, what used to be called Paradise Alley, which is between the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. I was reading this story, I saw the names, I read it quick. It didn't click. It didn't click because the names were slightly, slightly different. And then uh, when I read the book uh, two or three times and I read other things, it finally hit me that all those names that they were talking about were family names that I knew from our villages. For example, uh, uh, Pantazelos. You know, we, we, Pantazelos is a, it was, a, was a family uh, from our, our village, um, et cetera. So uh, I looked at those names and, uh, and I started to try to find out what basically happened. Now let me, let me give you just a little bit about this story. The story was basically, was basically that uh, it had to, has to do with padrons, give people money uh, to, go to, uh, to go to the United States and uh, they had to pay them back. If they didn't pay them back, they basically uh, would confiscate their properties uh, in properties in Greece. So the way, the way they, uh, they talked about it in, in the press was that the mayor basically had this thing that this padron system that he was working out with other members, um, with other members of, the, uh, of the village and uh, et cetera. The interesting to, thing to me is, uh, and why I'm interested in that particular scenario, is when, when you analyze it, and I haven't been able to get the records, even though I did talk to uh, George Tsellos actually at, at Ellis Island, he said the records did not, it did not exist in New York at the time. Because I believe that if I went into those records and looked at those names, I may in fact find my grandfather himself as being one of those names, one of those 60 people, because all these people were related to each other. Uh, back to the area. So, um, so they, they, worked, they worked hard. They saved their money. In many cases, in the, in the early days, they didn't, um, they didn't even eat a lot. They basically saved the money from, the, from uh, they wouldn't go to restaurants or things like that. They would save the money <clears throat> just so they can uh, either send back home or in many cases, like my grandfather, go back home and, and basically buy property. They would, <clears throat> uh, they would be on the, on, the lower, on the lower west side because in a lot of cases, a lot of the fruits and vegetables would come in the ports. At that time, New York was a, was a major port city, obviously. And uh, the banana boats and things like that would come in. They'd go in the morning, basically buy the bananas, and then sell them, sell them uh, in the streets um, uh, to do that. So a lot of the family members would work in a food-type business. Uh, some of them would work in, uh, in restaurants and things of that nature. Uh, Demostenius, who was my, uh, my, uh, my father's brother, uh, basically ended up working. Eventually, he learned English. As a matter of fact, I found uh, his English book where he was learning you know, how to speak English. And, uh, and as I indicated, he became a citizen in 1907. The interesting thing was he didn't become a citizen in 1907 in, uh, in New York City, but he was actually in Lynn, Massachusetts uh, at the time. Uh, and that's where he became a citizen. And that, in fact, when his sister came over, when their sister came over, Panayota, she actually went to Lynn. And as a matter of fact, Andonius, who was the younger brother that I mentioned earlier, uh, also was, was, in, was in Lynn. Okay, so, so what is the linkage? So you're saying, what is the linkage? Uh, 1897, well, the, part of the linkage was that around 1907, there was a, there was a, a depression in, uh, in, in the U.S., in America in particular. 
And a lot of people actually, uh, a lot of the immigrants who came, many of them went into Massachusetts to work in the factories. So uh, many members of the family, and now I'm not talking about only the Katsei at this particular time, because even to this day, there's Katso's family members in Lynn, Massachusetts, in St. George, in the same location, around the same location of where they were 100 years ago, which is, which is in itself amazing. But also, besides Lynn, they went towards uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. And in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, uh, and why did they go to, to Lynn, to Lowell, and uh, you know, eventually into uh, New Hampshire and then into Maine? What, what, what's the connection? A lot of the connection had to do with the fact that there were uh, agents, basically, uh, travel agents uh, that would bring the people over. And a lot of these travel agents, one of the largest one actually, was, uh, was from the village of Yorizzi. So, uh, and as a matter of fact, if you go into the records, if you go into the records of uh, of uh, even the Greek directories. There were early Greek directories. And you'll see, for example, the travel agency that I mentioned was a family by the name of Guzulis, which is also, which is also one, of the, one of the families of, of Yorizzi. Uh, at the time that we're talking about, in the early 1900s, from my village uh, and the vill surrounding villages, there could have been maybe five, six hundred people in the United States, many of them in Massachusetts, etc. Uh, my village, uh, Yorizzi at the time, in around 1915, had a population of about uh, 2,500 people uh, in a village in the mountains, which is unusual, but it was a big village. But, but you also, and I, again, this is a very large history, and I don't want to take too much time on it, but you'll find that the first the first Hellenic American church that was ever built from the ground up new, which is the Holy Trinity uh, Cathedral in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, which, was, uh, which was built around 1908. Uh, the president at the time was, uh, was a Guzulis, who was in fact from my village. And if you look at the old records, for example, there was a large society of uh, what, what they call Yoritsani, uh, that had to do with an organization called Osocrates. Okay, these again are, are uh, part of the uh, Hellenic American history. But it's a very interesting history, and again, a history that uh, as I was growing up, it's not a history that I knew when I was very young, but it's a history that I, that I, that I, that I learned when I started to analyze all these different things and all these connections. Many of the families that uh, are in the villages, many of the families that I know, were still linked, even if they were in the United States for 100 some odd years, our families are still linked across, across the continents. We know the family members, we can pick up the phone and call somebody in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, or what have you. And one of the things that I did establish when I got older is to find members of my family, my direct family, not the other families that I mentioned in Yorizzi, et cetera, which, which I know, but also the Katsei of Massachusetts that were here from the, uh, 1907, including obviously some of my people. Just a little bit of history also on uh, some of my uh, uh, grandfather's brothers. Uh, one of his brothers, like I said, uh, went and worked in the, uh, in the railroads, which was, uh, which was uh, not in the railroads, building the railroads, but actually working on the trains, which was, uh, I guess, uh, a step up in the scenario because you had to know English uh, to do those type of things, and he took the opportunity and time to, to learn English. My other, my other, uh, my, um, uh, my grandfather's other brother, uh, Andoni, who was the youngest one, uh, he uh, was known in the family as the wrestler because the other thing that took place is there was a lot of katsei for whatever reason that also, you know, were wrestling for some reason. So I have a picture of Andonis as the wrestler, uh, Nikitas uh, as the wrestler, etc. So there's a whole, there was a whole thing of, of Greek wrestlers uh, in the very early days uh, of the 19th century. His son, uh, his son, um, his eldest son, uh, George, okay, because my, my great grandfather was named uh, was George Yorgos, uh, my father's uh, my grandfather's uh, father. So therefore, the eldest sons uh, of the uh, of the children were named George. Uh, in my family, my grandfather's family, uh, George was in the navy, and he died. Uh, and right now, he's buried 
uh, in the Arizona, the USS Arizona. Uh, his name was George Katsos, spelled with a C. And uh, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on, uh, in December, uh, December 7th, uh, basically his ship went down. And, uh, and the name George in my family uh, basically disappeared from his death. As I indicated, uh, my grandfather did uh, not want to come into the United States and, and uh, therefore, since he did not want to come into the United States, uh, he couldn't bring his children, obviously, with him. Most of them were married at the time. Uh, but my aunt was uh, a single, uh, my aunt Christina, and uh, uh, they made an arrangement for her uncle uh, to bring her to bring her to the United States, and uh, she left right after the war. It must have been like maybe 46, 47, uh, and she came over. And uh, on the basis of her coming over, uh, was the basis of uh, um, of which then the, she could bring her family members, uh, her brothers, etc., over. So. In, in those days, it took a long period of time for someone to have the, um, uh, the ability to bring you over. She had to become a citizen, obviously, in order, in order to bring us over. So our family, she finally made the paperwork for our family. And, and again, my aunt was brought over by Andonis, uh, who, had lost, who had lost his eldest son at, at the time period. Uh, some of the cousins uh, were uh, in, in different uh, businesses. In other words, Andonia's uh, children were, one was a policeman, for example, in, uh, in New Jersey. Another one was actually a singer, and he had uh, uh, actually a pseudonym. He had an Italian uh, name, singer, but he did sing some Greek songs and he did sing some, uh, uh, some other songs. So my, uh, my aunt uh, uh, did get married in the, in the United States. Uh, they, uh, she was in Brooklyn. And then uh, uh, she made the paperwork to, uh, to bring our family over. So uh, we had to wait a few years, and, uh, and we came in, uh, in 1956, about uh, 60 years ago. We came by boat. You know, we came by boat uh, in the United States. Uh, we were living at the time in the, uh, both my father was, uh, uh, had established himself in Yorizzi because he got married in the early, uh, 1940s, so basically our house was in Yorizzi, and uh, we came from the village, we were up in the mountains, and basically uh, uh, traveled um, uh, to, come to, the, to come to the U.S. Uh, I was about four years old uh, when, I, when I came into the U.S., um, and uh, the area we went into uh, was what we would call today um, a term that's not used anymore, but basically it was a ghetto. In other words, where my, where my aunt lived was a, an area uh, which was at one time a, a Judaic area where many had fled uh, because uh, uh, Hispanics and African Americans were moving in. So, so the area was, uh, was uh, what was termed in those days, in the 50s, uh, a ghetto. Our family did owe, owe money because obviously there, uh, we came owing money. Uh, for the um, for the fairs and things like, of that nature, uh, my parents uh, uh, their first jobs you know they had to get jobs obviously. Uh, my mother worked in a factory, uh, and there were uh, in those days there were a lot of Greek women uh, who worked in factories. The women basically worked in factories. In in, in that particular era, uh, the immigrants, uh, the female immigrants, were all in factories. And in many cases, she would work in the factories and then bring uh, what we would call piecemeal work into the house. So people would sew in the house uh, to make uh, additional money. My father uh, had gotten a, a job in, um, in uh, basically, I guess it would be a dry goods, a Greek dry goods type place, uh, which was in Lower Manhattan. And in those days, there was a, a a very large community, as I indicated, between the uh, Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge, which no longer exists. Uh, and don't forget, there were, two ch there were two churches there. There was St. Nicholas on one end, and there was uh, St. Barbara Ayavarvada on, on the other end. And that area towards Ayavarvada, which was the Lower East Side, was a very large uh, Greek community with stores and the buzukia and card-playing things. 
and people who were from the 19th century. In other words, there weren't only families and people like that, but there were also single men who never got married. Uh, and everything you could possibly imagine that you read about in books existed during that time period. Uh, the single families, the, uh, the people who, who played cards, the people who would go from New York to Chicago, and you know, and everything that involved, the uh, cafenia, et cetera, uh, that all existed in, in the lower Manhattan area. It doesn't exist anymore, but that's, that's what existed during the time period. So he worked there for, uh, initially, and what took place was that uh, there were no, there were no um, babysitters, let's say, to take care of the children, obviously. Uh, uh, the woman, uh, my, my, my mother, my uh, sisters, uh, my mother and my sister, more my mother, she would work in the factories, she'd bring home work, etc. Uh, my sisters would help uh, uh, sew things so they can, uh, they can make uh, additional money. <clears throat> in the beginning we lived with my aunt because we had no place and then after a little while we moved, we moved nearby uh, in that area, which, uh, which is around what I call uh, Snedeker, Belmont Avenue, uh, which at the time was described, not by my language, but by the language of the time period, as a ghetto. Uh, so uh, my father, uh, since there was no babysitting and things like that, and people were going to, working, going to school, or what have you, uh, my father asked the uh, dry goods person <clears throat> if uh, he can bring his son, me and myself, to be around him. Uh, because who's going to take care of the, uh, the children? And basically it was uh, myself being in the uh, dry goods place uh, that created, <laughs> it sounds very strange, but I sort of created what happened afterwards because one of the things that happened was uh, I somehow caught my ear on a, on a nail or something in one of the dry goods scenarios and the, and the fellow who owned the dry goods store said to my father, hey, you can't bring uh, your son uh, to, to this location because we're afraid you know something may happen to him and what was going to happen uh, my father um, my father obviously had to do something with his son and he decided basically to uh, to go into another another business and I'm sure that that his decision was also based on having saved a little bit of money and also the fact that he had he had learned what was going on in the in the community so what he decided to do is basically go into the push cart business and uh, sell hot dogs. And uh, at the time, uh, he had saved, uh, you know, the, by the time this happened, he had saved enough money uh, to basically uh, buy a push cart, but also buy a spot. In other words, in those days, you could not just take a push cart and go into the street. You had to literally buy the location uh, that you were going to sell, uh, sell at. So uh, in his case, uh, uh, and at the time, Lower Manhattan had very few uh, peddlers, meaning uh, pushcart people who sold hot dogs. And the reason why is because it was totally regulated. In other words, uh, uh, as we indicated before in discussing uh, my grandfather, it was the same thing at that particular time. In other words, uh, you had to buy a spot and you can only buy the spot if somebody s sold the spot. So in my case, uh, in our case, uh, my father bought the spot which was right in front of the U.S. Customs House. Uh, he paid $4,000 uh, for that particular spot. It was an excellent spot. And uh, he became uh, a hot dog vendor. Uh, the hot dog vendors in Lower Manhattan were all, were all, uh, were all Greeks. In many cases, they were from the islands. At about age seven, uh, you know, we lived in Brooklyn, the, the uh, East New York, in Brooklyn, and uh, so I would be coming into the city. Uh, Any time that I, uh, obviously, when I became five years old, I would go to, um, I would go to school. But any time where I wasn't, in fact, in school, I would be going into Lower Manhattan to be with my father, because, as we said, there were no nobody to take care of you, basically. So in many cases, uh, not many cases, I would basically come into Manhattan from the east side of Brooklyn by myself, by train, uh, which people would not do today at age seven. I had no problem, I would just go back and forth to the train. My father would leave very early, because in those days, uh, all the pushcart guys, they would have to come in early to get the sodas, 
to fix up their carts, uh, to bring their carts, etc. And there was no need for me to be there, you know, at uh, five o'clock in the morning or anything like that. So I would come, basically, when uh, when it was a little bit later, and then uh, I would help my father. So we would be in a push cart. Uh, you know, he would do the hot dogs. I would grab the sodas. Give me a coke. Give me a this. Give me a that. And. Uh, and uh, eventually, not only my father had that uh, corner, but then my, 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 aunts, uh, my aunt also uh, went into the push cart business also. And she would, uh, they, uh, and my uncle, they would have a, a push cart by the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. So my father was at the uh, Customs House, which is right at the beginning, as you know, in Lower Manhattan of the start of Broadway. It was an excellent spot. And um, he would do a fantastic business. Uh, what else did I do during the uh, in-between hours after the lunch hour was over and you had the big crowds from Wall Street come down for the hot dogs? Uh, basically, my father said to me one day when I was about eight years old, you know, the bottles in those days, you return them, they, they were two, uh, two cents a, a bottle. So uh, he, he'd say, listen, why don't you make some money, go collect some bottles. So what I would do is I would run around with a cart as a little kid, and I would, um, I would get the bottles, and uh, within a half hour, uh, I would basically pick up 300 bottles, make $6, and then uh, that was uh, uh, from that money that I saved is when my father uh, established my first bank account, okay, from the money uh, to collect the bottles. As time, as time went on, um, my, father's, uh, my father did very well in that business, and uh, he decided to, uh, to also have peanuts. So he also established a peanut thing where you would sell cashews, pistachios, uh, peanuts, uh, chestnuts, let's say, during the winter. So when, when I was about 12, 13 years old, uh, I uh, basically uh, was on a push cart myself selling, selling peanuts in my off hours. Let's say uh, it was during the summer, or let's say it was during the weekend. During the summer, I would basically work in Lower Manhattan, right across the street from my father. Uh, during the weekend, I would work basically in front of the uh, uh, Staten Island Ferry. And uh, I did that for a while, but then it became a problem because the police uh, entered into the picture because I was underage. And also people were complaining. You know, I was underage, the other push car guy said, hey, listen, you got your son there, the police are, 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 uh, are chasing us, etc." So I basically had to hide out. Uh, the areas were controlled, the areas were controlled, and therefore, uh, uh, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of payoffs. In other words, you had to pay off the patrolman, and you had to, uh, obviously, it went up the line into the, into the hierarchies of, of the police force. These are not things that are talked about, and uh, after 50 years, maybe I can discuss them, but uh, it was certainly a reality in, uh, in Lower Manhattan, and things that most people know nothing about, but it was definitely a reality. So my father uh, you know, had that business, and, uh, and so how did, he, how did he then leave that business, which he was doing very well? and go into, uh, into a, a restaurant business. Uh, he ended up buying a restaurant. It's really a strange scenario, but uh, he helped a, a nephew actually uh, uh, buy a push cart and, uh, and set it up. And uh, the nephew didn't like the particular location he was in. And the nephew uh, basically eventually tried to put himself closer to, let's say, where my aunt was in terms of selling things, and uh, didn't want to basically follow the rules, let's say, that were established by the, by the community, including, uh, I guess, the law enforcement, whatever that meant. So he created a scenario, basically, where he, <clears throat> he started to <clears throat> say that the police were being paid off and everything that I just discussed. <clears throat> this created a crackdown within the area. And basically, uh, it was, uh, everyone was stopped from selling in uh, Lower Manhattan and, uh, and, uh, and taking out their push carts from where they were located. Their, their push carts were located in, uh, in older buildings that now are all high-rise buildings. Those buildings where their push carts were do not exist uh, anymore. 
in uh, lower Manhattan. The landscape is completely different. So for a period of time, uh, for a period of time, my father could not work at all. None of them could work actually. And uh, as a matter of fact, just going back a little bit, I remember, I remember as a young, as a young boy. Uh, talking about the tickets, because on occasion, uh, not only were they giving them payoffs, <clears throat> but the police also had to give uh, the, um, uh, the vendors tickets. So it could look like they were enforcing the law. So I remember as a kid, my father would have, would have a stack of summonses this big. And he would save them up, and then he would go to court, basically, and uh, have all these, uh, all these tickets, and then he would be in front of the judge, and the judge would... Uh, would say to him, uh, you know, blah blah blah. They would make a deal, and then he would he would pay off he would pay off uh, all the tickets. So when uh, my father tried to come out with his push cart, uh, you know, he was arrested a couple of times. Uh, he went in front of the judge. Uh, this is a funny story. Also, uh, the judge would say to him, Mr. Katzos. Uh, uh, you know what you were doing was illegal. He'd say, uh, Yes, Your Honor, I know it's illegal. Uh, my father didn't speak English that well, but he understood, he understood what he had to say. And then he would say, Mr. Katzos, uh, uh, if we let you go, uh, what will you do when you, get, when you get back? He said, I'm going to take out my push card and I'm going to go try to go into the, <laughs> into the corner. So it's kind of a funny story, a funny story in the family. So with that time period that, that uh, he couldn't work, uh, he decided uh, you know, with another Greek fellow to, uh, to, buy, to buy a store. Um, in, uh, in what is now Tribeca. Uh, we, we're the famous Tribeca where all the apartments are very expensive, etc. But when my father bought the store, uh, Ada's Lanchinette, uh, which was a place that was there for a long period of time by a fellow by the name of Otto, and right now it's probably historically the oldest uh, continuous, uh, let's say, luncheonette. When my father uh, decided to buy uh, Otto's Lanchinette, uh, it was a completely different area. Tribeca was an area that was a rough area. It was all where all the warehouses were, where all the warehouses were in lower Manhattan. In other words, uh, a lot of the produce, a lot of the, uh, the things that were sold in stores were all in warehouses in lower Manhattan. And uh, in the Tribeca area were a lot of them. The meat market was not that far away. Uh, so all that, all that whole area, which has become exclusive right now, in terms of very expensive properties, was all warehouses. And I remember as a young boy, uh, you know, by young boy at this time, I was, uh, I was probably about, um, I don't know, 13 or so. Uh, I remember uh, 12, 13, 13 probably. I remember going with my father to, uh, to all these uh, different warehouses to buy produce and things of that nature. And it was just amazing. It was an amazing city at that time. Places that had spices, this and that. And uh, even today, thinking about it, seeing those things, those things do not exist in New York anymore. But it was, it was spectacular, the amount of uh, produce and products that Lower Manhattan had and has now become the famous, uh, you know, the famous uh, Tribeca. Where Otto's Luncheonette was located was a, very, was a very rough area. It was a, an area that had... Uh, obviously produce, and it was an area where trucks would be coming in. So my, my father's place was basically a, um, a truck stop for truck drivers to come in from uh, all over the place. You know, rough, tumble type, uh, type people. Uh, the store was a small store. Uh, uh, it was my father basically, my mother, and my, and my uncle. Uh, my uncle, uh, uh, who was my mother's uh, sister's husband. My world was a little different than the world that most people, Greek Americans or Hellenic Americans, grow up in today. Uh, my world, again, started in the, in the, in the, uh, in the let's say, ghetto. Uh, my father rapidly, uh, over a period of time, saving money, etc., cetera, peddling, uh, bought a house in uh, what is now uh, around the Grand Amart Plaza area in Brooklyn. But our, our world was not a world with, uh, with Greeks around us. Okay, the people that were around us were basically minorities. Um, in, my, in my house, uh, uh, the front door basically was what, uh, the two different worlds. So from the front door of the uh, ha apartment, inside was our world, our people's world. And then outside of that uh, was the other world. 
these worlds were always um, were always separate. They were always separate. They were never they were never really linked. <clears throat> and the other nuance, which I didn't which I didn't really go into, uh, but our our people also. And this is true, not so much today. It's not true today, but in the past, uh, people when they spoke about when I spoke about uh, their people, they didn't speak about their people as being, uh, you know, all Hellenic people. When they spoke about our people, they spoke about our people around where we were. So uh, the other people were were Xenia. but when they referred to another Hellenic person that was not, uh, let's say, of our people meaning around our villages, all the rest of that type of stuff, they were basically Xenia. So I remember my parents saying, FTP uh, ran Xeno. And I say, what, what, what Xeno was that? They said it was, it was a, a person from a, another village who happened to be Greek, but he was a Xeno in, in, in our society. I wasn't around any, uh, any Hellenic people except people that were related uh, to us. In other words, the only time I would see Greek people are people that were related to us. In terms of the language, what, what, what took place was, obviously there was the world inside the household, the world outside the household. Very rapidly, <clears throat> I assimilated into, the, uh, into American society and English. So at a very early age, I picked up English. And, uh, and I, we were also laconic, OK? Liga Loya, in other words. So over time. I basically didn't, didn't speak Greek at all. I understood Greek, but I spoke, I spoke no Greek. I spoke some Greek, but very little Greek. And we didn't speak much anyway. I mean, we were all very close, obviously. But there was, uh, if somebody spoke to me in uh, Greek, I would speak to them in English. And that's the way, basically, it took place in the early years. Later it changed, and I'll explain why. But in the early years, there was, again, a separation. and. Uh, I will say one thing, though, that although I, 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 didn't, I didn't speak Greek, uh, or I stopped speaking Greek, I just spoke English, uh, I was, in fact, uh, connected with the community through the church. Uh, I remember at a very early age, even at seven years old, I would basically take the train and go to church. Uh, and, and, uh, and very interestingly, the church that I would go to which I was trying to figure out, and nobody could give me the proper explanation. I was going from East New York and Brooklyn to St. John's uh, uh, Church on 17th Street in Manhattan at a very early age. And as a matter of fact, later, maybe about five, six years ago, I remember one year going down to St. John's, because I usually go there every year during the uh, Holy Friday, because they used to take out the uh, Epitaphia. I remember going down to church and seeing only one photo in the church hall. And I looked at that one photo, and there was a priest with some kids around him, and there I was in the picture. And this I saw about five years ago. And uh, it, brought back, it brought back very memories. So I was always associated, always, with the church. And never with Sunday school. Never with Sunday school, only with the altar. From a very early age, I was either at the altar at, uh, at St. John's, very young, and then when I got a little bit older, as a preteen and as a teen, I would be in the altar of um, St. Constantine and Helen in, uh, in Brooklyn, the cathedral in Brooklyn. But back to the language. So uh, I would speak to everybody in English. They would speak to me in Greek. You know, and, and basically there was, there was no, there was, there was not this thing of pushing you with the Greek in, in, in my family. I feel very comfortable in my skin, in both skins. And I'll explain when we're going through again my background and history, et cetera, a little bit about, about what that means. But again, everything that was inside the door was totally familiar with, 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 uh, with, my, uh, with who I was. I knew it 100%. Uh, there was no reason even to speak, OK? Because in the, in the old days, not now, not now. People don't do that now. In the old days, especially with our particular culture, with, with people that didn't believe in, in polyloia, in, in saying too many words and talking too much, uh, there was a tremendous communication of body language. 
Okay? I knew exactly what my father was thinking just by the expression on his face, the raise of an eyebrow, a particular hand motion, etc. And, and we could, we could, we could, we could, by eye, by eye, we can, in a conversation, we can look at each other and know exactly what the other one was thinking. And something that I had developed at a very young age, which now, actually nobody does that anymore, but in the old days, it was something in, in our culture in particular uh, that, was, uh, that was a language of its own, the body language, the Hellenic body language. So we talked about the Hellenic side, but uh, in terms of the American side, there was no doubt that uh, we feel comfortable about being Americans. I, I, America is my country. I have no problem with that. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, they're totally integrated. In my mind, whatever, whatever's good for me as an American is good for me as a, as a Greek. The best things of both cultures are the same things in, in my mind. There's no, there's no conflict at all between being an American and being a Hellene at the same time and, and being um, a passionate, a passionate American and a passionate uh, Hellene. I love this country just like I love, uh, I love Greece and uh, there's no conflict whatsoever. All this time I was not, I was not uh, visiting Greece at all. In my case, I was trying to figure out like uh, who I am. So in order to find out who I was, because at the time also I liked to read. I used to go to the library all the time and I wanted to find out who I was. So basically I got all these books on, uh, on the Spartans. And the Spartans that I got were obviously the ancient Spartans. So I'm reading all this literature and things of that nature over a period of time. I became very knowledgeable in terms of ancient history. And then I, I felt that, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of funny, I felt that I had to be, I had to be like my people, the Spartans. So uh, what I did was, I, uh, for example, if it was in the winter, I didn't want to wear too many clothes. Sometimes when it was snowing, I would take off my shoes, etc., walk, walk out without, without uh, my coats, etc., because I wanted to be like my people. And this as a young man was what, uh, what I was thinking about, what it meant to be Spartan. It was really, really very interesting. I understood the fact that, you know, la coigne, you didn't want to talk too much, all the rest of that. And, um, and uh, that's the way basically my Hellenism was. It was actually the Hellenism that I was learning at that time uh, was in fact related to, to the ancients. And I was trying to become in many ways like the ancients. Um, exercise, run, uh, you know, uh, abstain from certain things. Um, like I said, cold, heat, etc. Those things didn't bother me. We were, we were talking about uh, my Hellenism and how it started and I explained <clears throat> how to a certain degree, my Hellenism had to do with what I read, meaning the ancient uh, literature and how I tried to become the ancient Spartan, or at least, you know, um, be like them. And at the same time, I, I grew up in an environment uh, where I was, um, where we actually didn't lose touch with, with, the, with the mountains of Greece. So I was raised also on the, Hellenist, on the Hellenic uh, side uh, in terms of what my people were like. Uh, in the mountains and things of that nature. So our music, clarina, etc., the village life, all those type of things, the songs, the dances, uh, these, were all, these were all of the countryside, these were all of the mountains, and a very strong part of my Hellenism related to, uh, to the mountain culture of the past. Uh, understand, since I wasn't going back to Greece and having that linkage with Greece, Greece itself was changing over a period of time, uh, uh, decade by decade. Whereas we in the United States, and you'll find this also with a lot of the older immigrants, were frozen in time. So in my particular case, my Hellenic culture was frozen in time uh, from the 1950s, because that's how I was raised, from the 1950s um, uh, in the mountains. So my Hellenism related to that particular culture. Uh, and as years passed by, that's the only culture that I knew, that's the only culture that, uh, uh, that I was raised with. My first time I went back to Greece was when I was, uh, when I was 16 years old. It was the first time <clears throat> uh, since I had left. And uh, 
I remember it uh, because it, uh, it was, to a certain degree, a, a, a huge shock to me. A huge shock in many ways because, uh, number one, I didn't find the ancient Spartan types. Uh, I found people that, uh, you know, like my relatives, my cousins, and things like that. They had a lifestyle that was a little bit different than mine. Uh, I would get up early in the morning. I wouldn't get much sleep. I would do all these uh, work things. I would have, in many cases, two or three jobs. I would work in a store. I would, I would have another, I would work in a delicatessen near my house. Uh, so anytime I was off, it was, it was always work. So I go to Greece, and I see, I see, uh, I see my uh, various relatives, etc. Sleeping in the afternoon, uh, tired, they can't, uh, they can't run up a mountain very quickly, they're not as strong, whatever. And then uh, also the society, the Hellenic society um, uh, that I was raised in, it became obvious that this was not, uh, in fact, what was uh, on the home ground in Greece, that things had developed. That trip uh, gave me an enthusiasm to learn and try to discover what happened. In other words, how did, how did these people uh, become like this? How did they get like this? And how, how did, in fact, uh, my, own, my own parents have their particular lifestyle in the mountains and things of that nature? So at a very early age, at about 16, I started at a different education in terms of my Hellenism. I started to uh, want to speak more of the language, let's say, and had no problem with communicating or starting to communicating with others but then started going into the history of our people across the board. In other words, not only the classical stuff, but also the Byzantine stuff, also the rural stuff, also the revolutionary stuff, and also the history of our people in, in the United States. So that, um, and also I collected books. So over a period of time, uh, you know, I educated myself in terms of uh, my Hellenism. Um, to the point where, to the point where, in, in some cases, I, you know, I'm not saying this to brag, but in some cases, I know, I know the history of our people, both in uh, in uh, the Hellenic Republic and in the United States, better than most people, because uh, number one, I researched it, I studied it, I collected the books, have my own libraries on, on certain things. But at the same time, as it is with the Hellenic American experience, uh, I, I lived that experience. In other words, many people uh, have written books about uh, immigrants, about their parents, about their grandparents, and things of that nature. But I've lived that experience. I was that immigrant. I did work those streets. I did work as a peddler. Uh, I was around the city with people that were from the 19th century, and I had basic experiences uh, that most people do not have. And the other thing is, and, uh, and uh, in your research you'll find that very few people, uh, and very, uh, very few people have written actually books on their lives as children immigrants. In other words, you'll find usually people writing about their lives later in life. You'll find people writing about their parents, grandparents later in life after doing research. But very few people have really lived the life of the immigrant and at the same time written about it. A lot, obviously, has to do with the fact that a lot of people who live the life of the immigrant and some of the things that we've talked about and some of the things we have not talked about because it takes hours and hours and hours to basically go into, into a life. Uh, but very few people have lived those lives and understand what those things, what those things mean. It was difficult to call me a, an Amerikanaki because there were certain aspects of my particular behavior pattern that was extremely recognizable to everybody. In other words, the older people in particular, the older people in particular, anyone who was uh, of a certain age, my father's age, my grandfather's age, my great-grandfather's age, people who were old, and they saw me and they spoke to me, they saw, they saw their, their, their world. Because as I indicated, my world had frozen at a particular point in time. Cousins thought, thought of me as uh, someone who, uh, who they, in the beginning, they could not really understand because, I don't know, it was, it was, I, was, I was also bigger, I was also stronger. Uh, and uh, they were enthused, actually, because I was actually the Helene. In other words, I came back to Greece. And maybe they didn't know how to dance the dances, but I knew how to dance the dances. Maybe they didn't know the particular songs, etc. But I knew them. And when I when I went into the mountains, 
When I finally went into the mountains, then I saw my people. In other words, when I was in other places, they weren't really my people. But when I went into the mountains, you see, you see your people. So uh, it was very interesting to me. Actually, uh, actually, when I went to, to Greece the first time, uh, I was in the village, and uh, I, like I said, I was with my mother. And uh, my mother said when I was in the village, she said, be very careful uh, because uh, there may be uh, a vendetta type scenario. Because I, I told you the story earlier about the relative that had the push card, et cetera, uh, who then uh, triggered the police investigation and all the rest of that. But it translated to, uh, to his family, which is our, some of our family members, uh, a wing of our, not my immediate family, but people uh, related to us, of like we did something wrong to this particular person that came to the United States. In other words, like we were at fault. So my mother said, listen, we have to be careful uh, uh, that uh, you know, that particular family may try to do something. And for me, it was kind of funny. It was kind of funny, I looked at her and I said, because also our lifestyle, and again, remember I was 16, so it's a, it's a different, my world is a different world right now. But when I was 16, uh, as I indicated, I was, I was uh, living a certain lifestyle, and uh, I was big, I was strong, and it was kind of funny to me because uh, we used to get into fights all the time. In other words, it was, it was something that was um, natural. It was natural for us to fight. And as a matter of fact, uh, many of the Hellenic people at the time period, my people in particular, uh, were very aggressive types. They were good people, they never would bother anybody but no one could ever bother them. In other words, uh, uh, we, could turn, we could turn violent immediately if someone tried to be aggressive with us. And it didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter whether they had knives, whatever. In, in the past, they used to say when, uh, when two Greeks, uh, this is kind of a joke, not a good joke, but uh, when two Greeks together, get together, they open up a restaurant. When three get, uh, people, uh, Greeks get together, they start a revolution. So uh, from our particular perspective, um, we were, we, were, we were sort of aggressive types if you bothered us. We were the, the kindest and gentlest people if you didn't bother us. We had the total philotimo and all the rest of that. If you bothered us, if you pushed us, it, it, was, it, uh, it, it turned completely who we became. In terms of anti-authoritarianism, uh, uh, revolts and all the rest of that, uh, our people were always against against authority. I mean, it's as simple as that. My father was against authority. I was, against, I was raised against authorities. We, we were not people that uh, you know, wanted to be uh, ruled or pushed by anybody. So uh, that was our basic uh, behavioral type. You know, it's where we came from. You know, that's, that's who we were. If we talk about the um, Hellenic American community, uh, understand that there are different aspects of the Hellenic American community. And again, it has to do with immigration patterns when people came over, when they didn't come over, and things of that, of that nature. Um, you'll find that, there's, that even within our own people here in, here in the United States, from the old days, not now, from the old days, there was always, there was always a, a sort of like an undercurrent of conflict between people who came, for example, from Greece and people who are Hellenic Americans here in the United States. There always was that conflict. I remember it as, a, as a, when I was a young boy. I remember it was when I was in college. I remember it in any organization that, that I joined, that there was always, there was always this, this thing about, about people who were born here, raised here, depending on when they came, obviously, and people who were born and raised in Greece. It wasn't a conflict, uh, you know, that was one-sided. In other words, both sides felt that there was a, that there was a problem of, uh, of each other. Uh, so you will have, as strange as it sounds, it's not a discrimination, but there is a discriminatory aspect uh, among the two groups within the Hellenic community here in the United States. Always been that way. And, uh, and maybe, maybe we'll continue to be that way, but um, there are some of us who feel very comfortable as being uh, Hellenes and very comfortable as being Americans simultaneously. That is not the norm. That is not the norm. And uh, you'll find it in all the organizations that we're talking about. In, in, in other words, all organizations 
and I don't want to name organizations, they will have this, not conflict, but they will have this, uh, this differential of thought processes between, between the two groups. It exists right now. The future of Hellenism really has to, has to uh, go along the lines of what, what I was talking about before. We have to bridge the gap. There have to be facilitators to bridge that gap and to create, an, uh, and to create a uniformity and an understanding of the two different groups. In my case, I happen to be fortunate because I am an immigrant. My people were immigrants. My society was closed at the door. I was frozen in terms of time, in terms of Hellenism. Although when I started going back to Greece, I caught up, but still I'm frozen deep down inside in my brain. Uh, but also, I was the American uh, in uh, Hellenic societies and all the rest of that, in American groups, uh, Hellenic American groups. People are very comfortable with me. They regard me as an American. Um, the Greeks, I think, uh, regard me as, uh, as a Hellenic American, but a Greek at the same time. And after people speak to me, in some, in some cases, I remember even when I was working at the company you're talking about, um, they would say amongst themselves, they were all from Greece, they would say that, that he's more Greek than the Greeks. In other words, in other words that uh, my Hellenism was just a little bit different than their Hellenism because it was older. One third about, not quite, almost one third of the Hellenic population okay, is outside of Alas, as you know. They're in the diaspora. Now, some of them, some of them even by the, uh, the uh, Hellenic people in uh, Greece, are not considered Greeks by those people. In other words, some of those people that I'm talking about, the one third that's outside uh, of the, of the uh, Hellenic world, is not considered Hellenic. Uh, a lot of it has to do with language, the language that they speak. And a lot of it has to do with what happens over time as you're living in a different culture. The diaspora has a lot to offer uh, the, um, the Hellenic nation. And the diaspora, the diaspora itself, uh, uh, some of them are basically, especially within the recent time frame, and because of also the things that are happening uh, right now in Greece, they're sort, of try, they're sort of slowly detaching themselves from being associated with, uh, with the Hellenic Republic. <clears throat> in the past, let me explain what was going on in the United States in terms of Hellenic Americans. We were considered a colored people. We were chased by the KKK. We were discriminated against in, in many cases. There would be newspaper accounts. Uh, a Greek is uh, going out with a white woman as being like the big news of particular areas. They would burn down our stores, all the rest of that. We were treated as second-class citizens. We couldn't enter into theaters. These are things that people don't talk about right now uh, or, or even understand historically what, what took place. The transformation of how we were looked upon had to do with the stopping of Mussolini on the borders of, of Greece. In other words, as Europe was collapsing, as nation after nation was collapsing, as the people were afraid of the fascists taking over all of Europe, when in fact they said Ochi and they went, they went there and stopped the fascist forces in, uh, in, uh, in uh, southern Albania, you know, northern, northern Greece, is when the world was totally shocked. How could this small country, for the first time in, in all the series of, of battles and things that were taking place, how could this small country stop the fascist powers? This hit all the newspapers of the United States. Okay? This created a pride within the Hellenic people. And this, this single thing transformed the way people looked upon the Hellenic Americans. All of a sudden, we were something else. We were like the ancient people. We were like the people defending, defending uh, things, uh, et cetera. So I was the recipient of that. In other words, when I was growing up here, you, you, saw, you said to someone you were, you were a Hellenic person, you were Greek, oh, a Greek, et cetera. That, that's not what my grandfather experienced when he came over, or all the other people that I talked about. Now, with what's happening in Greece, okay, the propaganda that's taking place from the EU, the creditor country, countries, in particular Germany, okay, to disguise a lot of different things, okay, in fact, to save their own banks, because in reality, in reality, if somebody had defaulted their own banks, the French banks and the German banks, okay, which were the largest uh, creditors in terms of Greece, they would have collapsed basically, okay. So what did we do? 
Okay, what did we do? We basically, by, by, uh, by signing the memorandums, etc., we gave them time. They allowed themselves to save their banks, transfer, transfer the liabilities into the nations, and then basically turn it around on us to, to create a scenario. And then when they were trying to create this lie, this lie about our people, they started to create the propaganda of the lazy Greek, of the this Greek, of that, of this, of that, of that, that we're at fault. In other words, our skirts were too short, and therefore we should be raped. So this is the transformation that I see now as an as a older person, where I had the benefit of what happened with the stopping of the fascist powers. And now I'm older, and now I see a reversal of what people are thinking about our people internationally. So um, this obviously infuriates me because now I'm not uh, only just a Hellenic American, but I'm a Hellenic person also. I don't like people referring to our people under certain negative stereotypes. Also, just to understand where I'm coming from, and I'm a little bit different than most people. I come from the pre-EU period, okay? As I indicated to you, my Hellenism is frozen deep in my mind, not up front, but deep in my mind to the past. So, I'm pre-EU. I never associated with being a European. In other words, in my mind, even though, yes, we were the first Europeans, but in my mind, when we were in Greece or in the United States and we spoke about the other, the other, the Europe, they were somewhere else. They were other people. They were not us. So, in my mind, I was never an EU person, okay? In my mind, deep. I was never an EU person. I am, just like I am an American for America, I am a Hellene for a last period. I'm not for the EU. I could care less about the EU. I could care less about the other nations, okay? I could care less about the Eurozone and all this other nonsense that they did. And in my mind, I view this as just, uh, as just a trick by what they couldn't do in World War II by taking over the nations. They did the financial trick to take over and create client nations within all of Southern Europe, inclu including Greece. So from my perspective, I am, I am annoyed at what's happening, not only with the uh, EU, the Germans and the creditors and all that who are spreading this nonsense and propaganda, but I'm also annoyed personally at our own people who are accepting this nonsense and in fact being agents, being agents just like there were agents in the, uh, in the Ottoman period, agents for the Ottomans, agents for the Neo-Ottomans, and creating scenarios, memorandums, etc., where they're selling off their nation. So my view of, of uh, my Hellenism and my view of, of Greece and the way people should be behaving, etc., is a little different than most people's.